I have the luxury of, of uh, having the last word. I promise not to abuse that and will be very brief. We began this workshop with the observation that amateurs talk about tactics, professionals talk about logistics, but the real insiders talk about personnel policy because it's personnel policy that influences everything. <clears throat> this observation underscores both the enormous responsibility and the constraints under which the sponsor of this workshop uh, must perform its important mission. And that mission is not performed in a vacuum, but rather uh, the objectives are moving targets, made so by technology, but also by political and procurement decisions. For example, I did a study of topside combat systems years ago, uh, in particular the phalanx close-in weapons system, the Gatling gun with two radars for uh, close-in ship defense. When General Dynamics sold the Navy on that system, they said, hey, this is going to save you a lot of money you're not going to have to train electronic technicians. You'll just have to have people of low skill who can look at the red and green lights, and when something goes wrong, they interpret the lights, read the step-by-step -step instructions, and pull out the line replaceable unit and send it back, and they'll get a new one, replace it. It's really easy, and that works very well. The system works fabulously when all the line replaceable units are in green, uh, and the repair works very well when you're tied to the dock. But as soon as you go abroad, go to sea, or especially if you go abroad, uh, and your logistics chain is stretched, uh, I learned that uh, the first time I heard the term uh, in the mid '80s, uh, if your LR LRUs go down when you're when you're in the I/O, you're in the hurt locker because FedEx doesn't deliver. So if you have a maintenance philosophy based on low skilled personnel. You have to have a very rich logistics chain. The solution in the Navy is for the senior chiefs to go to the local electronics stores before they deploy, buying handfuls of little, un little resistors and transistors and, and whatnot. And when they get, because the Navy didn't, uh, didn't buy the schematics that would allow a technician to even repair the system, if, uh, what they do is they, they pull out a line replaceable unit that burns, that has failed. They don't have a replacement, and so they look for scorch marks, and then they say, oh, that has two little, rebel, two little blue bands on it, and they look in their collection, they find them, and with the soldering iron, they put it back together, and the thing works. It's through the ingenuity of the senior chiefs that the systems are put back in place. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for in ingenious suit, uh, senior chiefs, the Navy would remain tied to the docks. <clears throat> so, uh, in answer to P Professor Hunt's question, uh, do you really need a, a person of that caliber in the artillery? I think sometimes you do to, to work around those constraints. Well, I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, Tom Bouchard, who some of you know from his long and distinguished career uh, at the University of Minnesota, encouraged me to read two exciting new books. This will date me. Uh, one was titled Groups Under Stress by Captain Roland Radloff and Robert Helmreich. Uh, Robert Helmreich went on to found the, the uh, practice called, uh, cock, well, it was originally cockpit resource management, then crew resource management, which was extended to surgical teams and uh, is used throughout uh, the military aviation uh, and in uh, commercial aviation to facilitate performance on the flight decks of aircraft. Uh, the other book was a new book, Unobtrusive Measures by Webb and Campbell and others. And the latter one influenced at least a, at least a generation of behavioral scientists and fostered in me in, per, in particular a healthy suspicion of traditional testing methods and a general preference for unobtrusive and non-reactive methods. Um, I'm rereading that book now as a kind of trip down memory lane, and aside from the systematic uh, grammatical errors uh, that annoys me now at this stage in my life, uh, I was reminded that the main purpose of that book, their main point, wasn't about unobtrusive measures. It was about the importance of multiple measures to improve predictive validity. 
And I think that's an important message that maybe we could stand to uh, relearn. <clears throat> If all the principles of the social sciences were listed in descending order uh, of their validity, certainly at the top of that list would be the best predictor of future performance is past performance. Analogs are used in all of the sciences when access to the actual conditions are denied, uh, either uh, practically or ethically. Um, uh, engineers use scale models to test bridge designs. Um, Medical researchers use animal models. Psychologists use sophomores and others. Um, uh, I studied conditions on Earth uh, characterized by isolation and confinement in order to derive uh, lessons uh, that might inform uh, future space exploration. Uh, tests are clearly analogs uh, for the actual observed behaviors that you would prefer to uh, have to inform your uh, selection decisions. But practical issues greatly constrain the fidelity and, as a consequence, the validity of, of those uh, uh, predictions. It seems to me that this is especially problematic in the field of uh, w when using simulations uh, to develop inferences about uh, groups that actually live together, sleep together, eat together, exercise together, uh, socialize together, and on whom each other's lives often depend. So you have a particular challenge uh, in simulating those conditions with some force and fidelity that uh, can result in meaningful uh, recommendations. So I'm going to end with that, except to say that uh, I want to thank all of the speakers who came to this to uh, join us and inform and, uh, and enlighten us with some spectacular presentations. I want to thank the members of the fellow members of the committee for your time and for these ideas for uh, these speakers. I want to thank our sponsor for honoring us with by asking us for our opinions on these important matters. And last, I want to thank the National Academies, uh, Barbara. Uh, Cherie and uh, Tina and their staff in particular for putting this all together. I think it was a spectacular workshop and I hope you were pleased with the results. Thank you. I'll just make one more comment just so that everybody knows probably late summer we will be publishing the summary of this um, this event and I will send an email out hopefully the end of next week to let everybody know that the online video is posted. Um, the web guys haven't freaked out that I said end of next week yet, so maybe that's a possible um, deadline. We'll see. But soon. Um, and we'll also send out the slides as well um, on that message for, for everyone who RSVP'd. And um, thank you so much for coming. And I just ask if the committee members could just make their way up here as we sort of um, release. So thank you. Have a safe trip. And uh, thank you. <laughs>